It says we're being live streamed, Elaine. That's so perfect. <laughs> okay. Although I do still have one bar that shows it's loading. All right. I believe we are officially on Facebook. So to start off, will you please introduce yourself? I know a lot of people who were going to, who decided the topic were excited that you were coming on. So they already know a little bit about you because you're pretty awesome. But for those who don't, please introduce yourself and talk about what you do for family farms and ranches. Hi, and good evening. I'm Elaine Fraze, farm family coach coming to you from mile 16 above the U.S. border, just above North Dakota in southwestern Manitoba. And I'm a farm family coach. I'm also mother to a successor or son. And I'm a farm family coach. I'm oh. also mother to a successor. Or... Sorry about that, Elaine. Go ahead. And I want you to grab the bull by the horns tonight with us. And uh, we're going to talk about some tough issues, but my goal with working with farm families for the past 30 years plus is to help families find harmony through understanding whether they're farm families or ranch families or even small family businesses. So really excited to be with you tonight, Shay, and here to um, give you more tools for your toolkit to have those conversations you may have been avoiding. Well, conversations, and that is a big thing that holds back a lot of people in life. It's, you know, they're easy to avoid, but they're usually easier to have than we think sometimes. Now, today, or tonight, I guess, we are going to talk about in-law relationships and navigating some of those conflicts, because that's what the listeners and my audience voted on last week or a couple weeks ago. So to start off, what are some of those main conflicts that you see with those in-law relationships now they may vary because every family dynamic is different but what's you what are your observations there well um one of them is that most daughter-in-laws if they're coming into a family ranch situation they want to have a voice and i'll just give the viewers a copy of farm on farming's in-law factory you can see the brown egg and i had a woman once one time she said hashtag i am the brown egg because she really felt like she was different from the rest of the family. And so when we're talking about marrying into a family or coming into a partnership in a farmer ranch, now you are the, you have your own ranch with your grandma and your grandma and grandpa and your parents. And um, so I'm, I'm not making the assumption that you might not be bringing a son-in-law with you, right? So it can be either or. But there's different different things that everybody needs. And, and I was just speaking last week in Alberta to the potato growers and I had this young woman come up to me in tears and she said, Elaine, I'm getting a divorce. And I said, tell me more. And she said, I was never allowed to be part of the family. I was never allowed to be part of the business. And she has like uh, an agron agronomy background, like she's highly skilled, right? And so the whole the whole thing about why these conversations are hard, Shay, is because very often the new person coming into the family, whether it's a, a woman or a man, they don't feel like they have a voice. And for son-in-laws, it's awkward because it's not their family of origin, so they don't know the culture. And we can talk about what culture is because culture is the glue that holds the family together. And then mothers, I'm the mother to my 34 year old successor son who lives right across 159 steps from my backyard, who's married to a wonderful woman, my favorite daughter-in-law, my only daughter-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and she's given us three beautiful grandchildren. So I wrote the book on farming's in-law factor with Dr. Megan McKenzie about eight years ago, and I have to walk the talk. So just ask me whatever you want. And if people are gonna uh, jump in the comments, that's great too. But Basically, it comes down to respect and having everybody have a voice and being clear about what their roles are in the business. You know, we could, there's a lot we're going to talk about and certainly can talk about, but since you brought it up, how about you talk about what that culture, that family culture is and why it's important to understand it? So what I would like people to do while they're listening to this is just write out if you can three words or, or or you know commit it to memory and the words are believe behave 
decide. So what do you believe to be true? I'm an optimist. I'm wired for lifelong learning. I believe there's always hope. And a lot of in-laws don't have that sense of hope. So what do you believe to be true is the first thing, first part of your culture. The second part is how do you behave toward each other? And one of the best compliments my husband gives me is you have an amazing brain. You know, so he respects my career as a coach and a professional speaker. He respects my education. And we've always been totally aligned in what we value and how we spend money and what our debt risk ratios are in terms of, you know, sleeping with a large operating loan or whatever, because I was a farm kid, he was a farm kid. But then the third piece, Shay, that's really important is how do you make decisions? And are the decisions made collaboratively? And I've, and I've got my rings with me tonight because there's three systems going on here. There's the family system, which we just talked about. So what's the culture of the family of your ranch? And I'm very thankful for a very positive, healthy culture, but we work at that. The next piece is the other system is what's the management of your ranch? And there's where the decisions come in. Is it dad's way or the highway? Is it mom's way or the highway? Or does everybody have a voice? And do you all try and put yourself in the other person's shoes and seek understanding? And then the last system is the ownership piece. And tonight we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of compensation, because that was a close second to farming's in-law factor in your poll. But you can see when I put these three rings together, why it gets really messy for people because there's all this stuff going on. And so I have a degree in home economics from 1978. I have a conflict and mediation certificate and I studied in Santa Barbara, California in 2003 to be an executive coach. So this system, the family is the one I think you and I will hone in on tonight mostly, but obviously if things are going well and there's a strong foundation in the family, then you are going to be able to talk about management and then you are going to talk about ownership and, and all that other good stuff. So I just want people to think about when I'm getting irritated here about not having a conversation, is it a family conversation that we need to have that affects the family system? Or is it something to do with the farm and ranch? And in some people's heads, those are all mushed together. And that's where it gets confusing. So you mentioned that you work hard to keep your family culture healthy. How can people kind of analyze to figure out do they where their family culture is like on the spectrum to healthy to extremely unhealthy? What are some things they can look for to determine where they're at? Well, one of the things is, are they able to talk about the bull in the middle of the room? So this is my talking stick that I use for, it's Beanie Baby Ox, if you want to buy this guy. Um, but whatever, it's it's the things that people aren't addressing. So one of the tools that we use as coaches is to understand your conflict dynamic profile. And you can do this assessment on my website and it's $35 US, but here's here's the good news. Do you have the ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes? So that's called putting yourself or creating perspective. You know, the ability, does your mom remember what it was like to be a new grad coming back like you have from university and starting fresh? Or do I recall, yes, I do, what it was like to be an exhausted young mom? So yesterday I had my grandchildren for a couple of hours so that my daughter-in-law would have a block of time to herself without her three children. And then she gets to choose how she uses that. But your question is about how do you know whether you have a good culture or not? Your mental health and well-being, I think, will tell you. And also, it'll be good if you can, if you can um, listen to podcasts or become more aware about what is healthy, because profanity is not healthy. I had a young man once whose father would swear at him every morning at the corner of the shop, and I'd say, you do realize, don't you, that that's not healthy and that's not normal. And he said, well, no, actually, Elaine, I didn't because this is what's happened ever since I was born. And so sometimes you need to ask or question behavior that's not, not serving you well anymore. And I have a saying, Shay, you get the behavior you that you accept. So on our farm, we don't work on Sunday, which is weird, but we don't have livestock. And we have a large 5,000 acre grain farm, but our employees love it. My, my husband and my son and our families love it because we know we have a boundary carved aside for family time. 
and going to church or having whatever pause time my son can go hunting you know there's all different th kinds of things you can do on a sunday right but that's another in-law factor conflict piece or irritation is that if you came into this marriage on the ranch and you thought that family time was going to be protected with some kind of healthy boundary and then you discover that it's all about the ranch the ranch comes first no matter what there's work to be done we don't have time and and again that's the narrative or the story that you and your husband have signed up for and you haven't come to the table to talk about wow this doesn't feel good i'm burned out i'm resentful of our marriage the kids are cranky because they're not seeing dad enough then my question is another conflict behavior what are you going to do together to create solutions and then the third positive active behavior is i'm frustrated I'm disappointed. I'm angry. And anger is not really a, a, a first primary emotion. It's a secondary one. So if you're angry, Shay, I suspect it's because you're hurt, you're afraid, or you're extremely frustrated. So what is it? That's a lot of really good insight. And I appreciate you diving into helping understand, you know, why we feel maybe that anger emotion. So you brought up boundaries which boundaries matter in all areas of life <laughs> i firmly believe it but so when do those conversations about boundaries need to be had between the um the in-law mm -hmm. that's marrying in compared to the senior generation and the spouse themselves like when do those boundaries need to be set or those conversations need to be had well, there's you know obviously the the people listening to this podcast know the value of strong fences and good gates right to keep the cattle or the livestock where they're supposed to be and keep them out of where they're not supposed to be so the whole concept of boundaries was first written about by dr henry cloud and, and townsend and they have a whole book called boundaries and a whole thing about about what is healthy and, and I, I like to think of it as do you ask for what you need I need good sleep so I need a quiet house I need um you know my husband right now is in the next room with his earphones on watching tv so he's not interrupting our podcast and our conversation that's a great boundary and that's a sign of this is what I need would you please do this so that Shay and I can have a good podcast right now, for a daughter-in-law situation, you asked me, I think, before, or how, you know, when you're coming into a marriage or a new partnership, what do you look for? And I would, if you're dating some country cowboy or cowgirl right now, I would be very, very observant of, of kind of just watching and see what's acceptable behavior and what's not, and whether people can handle the word no. No, not at this time. And or or are you living what what Dr. Cloud would call a boundary boundary less life where you just say, yeah, bring it on. I'll just do whatever, whatever you want. And then then you have no self-respect for getting what you need because you're always yielding and yielding, by the way. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dad. Yes, mom. Yes, ranch. Yes, farm. Yes, yes, yes. Without being clear about what's healthy for you. Yielding is actually a very destructive conflict behavior because at some point you've yielded so much without having any healthy boundaries for what you need that kaboom um carl uh, pillemeyer who wrote the book on fault lines and, and family estrangement he calls that a volcanic event so i would i would really question are you very clear about expectations going into your partnership in business or are you very clear about your expectations in marriage? And of course, that first year of marriage, Shay, is quite the roller coaster, right? Because you got two people coming from two different families of origin coming together, and now they they've committed to each other, and now they have to work out what they're going to say yes to and what they're going to say no to. Well, thank you for going into detail on that. So with boundaries, and this kind of ties into compensation as well, there's a boundary with where time goes because many people who have farms and ranches either have a second job themselves or have a spouse with another job. So 
what I guess advice do you have on the compensation side of that as far as people who are have another job, maybe they work from home, but maybe they're getting pulled onto the farmer ranch a lot because that's time being taken away from their business. So what advice do you have on the compensation front of that? Maybe that's just a compensation question in general. No, and that's totally fair. So Dick Whitman, W-I-T-T-M-A-N, WhitmanConsulting.com has an amazing farm management binder that every listener should buy. I think it's around $200 and it's digital. But if people reach out to me at Farm Family Coach, I'm happy to give you the compensation worksheets that Dick created because I'm a home economist. And so I want everybody to have enough for family living, Shay, and to live well. And what I see happening in a lot of ranches is that people are not being paid enough for a decent family living income. And if you go to another webinar that was put on by Farm Credit Services, it's called Two Economists and a Lender. Just Google Farm Credit, Two Economists and a Lender and watch that webinar because they did a survey in upper Midwest, like uh, Indiana, Ohio, Ohio, Illinois, over that way. But they also did South Dakota. And Minneapolis has also show, chimed in here. All of this to say, as a young couple with a couple of kids, you should be taking in for family living somewhere between seventy to $84,000 a year. And people say, well, Elaine must be nice. Well, guys, you need to have decent living income. And that income may be coming from your off-farm job. And, and some of it may be coming from the ranch. And then the third piece of it might be coming from what we call perk shay. So maybe the ranch is paying for your house possibly. Maybe they're paying for your truck and your fuel and your internet. How do you find out this number? You find it out by looking at your bank statements to say what is going through our, our banking system towards family life, life and family living. Why is this important? Because if you have nothing left over, then you don't have money to buy equity or debt and disposable income. And this becomes a problem because you're working your butt off on the ranch and then you're going to your off-farm job or you're working in your home office to get a different income, but it just doesn't seem to be quite enough. Now add to that problem that your parents are not being honest about where their family living money is going and they're doing as much padding as they can through the ranch and they're hesitant about stepping back or stepping away because they know that the ranch has to be able to sustain their family living line, right? Because unfortunately, they also don't have a personal wealth bubble beyond the ranch, which means they don't have other real estate. They don't have 401ks or Ross or in Canada, we call them tax-free savings accounts. Like they don't have something to help pay the bills that doesn't draw from the ranch. So here we go with another podcast talking about fairness and financial transparency, because there are older ranches. I'm 66. So let's pretend that by the time I was 66, I wanted to have $2 million set aside on my personal wealth side so that I could draw 4% a year and get a return of $80,000 a year so that my son and daughter-in-law didn't need to count on paying me anything from the farm. Unfortunately, that's not the case in most families. They didn't, they put everything back into the ranch. And that's when the business starts feeling like a monster because it's always about the ranch and there hasn't been a clear financial plan to compensate everybody well. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And, you know, that was on one of my last um, Rancher Mind events, one of my webinars, um, Dave Speck actually, actually talked a little bit about that. And I know that's something that's talked about a lot in the family transition space in general. So I appreciate you bringing that up and explaining that and even providing some options for others to look into by sharing your personal experiences. Well, and, and even Shay, if you're young, because I had a young rancher last Saturday who Friday, she said, Elaine, I'm young. I don't have $2 million. I go, no, no, not today, but you need to use the time opportunity of money and compounding interest and saving and investing to build personal wealth and not get trapped into always putting it into the business because you need flexibility and liquidity. And of course, we're talking about money, aren't we? And therein lies another in-law factor 
because what if your spouse comes from a paycheck family and they don't understand operating line and current debt? They don't understand intermediate debt for equipment and they have no idea that your land mortgage is going to be paid off over 20 years, not by next Friday, because you haven't explained the different kinds of good debt, bad debt and payments, right? So don't, right. don't make assumptions. So I have this list, this list shade called the phrase that pays, which is a play on my name. And one of my sayings is, Love does not read minds. So don't make assumptions. <laughs> Absolutely. Do not make assumptions about anything. Okay. So going back so that first question was, what are the main conflicts that you see? And so you talked about skill sets not being used. Or respected. Mm -hmm. Or respected. We just talked about money. What else? do you see kind of causing some conflicts that are conversations that need to be had? So in conflict resolution, there's this conflict, there's this idea of intent, action, effect, and it ties into love does not read minds. I have no idea what you're thinking right now, unless you talk to me and ask me a question. And so I always tell this story about you would not believe my mother-in-law when I'm away speaking, do you know what she does? She goes into my house, which of course used to be her house. And she puts baking in my freezer for her Mennonite son. Can you believe that? Okay, now let's grind the tape back. I would love to tell you about my amazing mother-in-law, Margaret Fraze. When I'm away speaking all across the country, she sneaks into my house, which of course used to be her house. And she puts amazing baker baking in the freezer for my husband while I'm gone. Isn't that awesome? So what just happened there? The same action, putting baking in the freezer. Number one, was she interfering? Or number two, was she helpful? And you see, that's what we do in families. We judge. And we judge people's behavior without finding out what was their intent. And Shay, when you came back from college, back to the ranch, you have an intent to be profitable. You have an intent to keep the ranch being the fifth, sixth generation, right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of dreams and goals you have. It's not your intent to cause harm. But the older generation is doing things that unintentionally is causing harm, grief, or a sense of feeling stuck. But they're not talking about it, the bull in the middle of the room, to create solutions. And they're not sharing emotions in a safe excuse me, and re respectful place because everyone's just doing the silent thing and hoping it's going to go away. And then I say, how's that working for you? So conversations need to happen. And these are usually or can be very emotional conversations because we are si tied so closely to our operations. A lot of people find their worth in their work and I that did. can be challenging. Not that that's right, but <laughs> um, so back to that conversation point, how can people, what are some steps people can take to start having and start these conversations that are viewed as delicate in a sense? So the first thing I want them to do about thinking about how they want to get to the table is to think about their approach. So first of all, as a young rancher, I would love to see your business plan. What is your vision for how the ranch is going to go forward? And I would like to compare your business plan to your father and mother's and to your grandparents. And are they, do they have alignment or is there like a, a huge disconnect? And that's data, Shay, right? Your business plan is profitability, number of cows, rotational grazing, regional ag, whatever, whatever your vision is. So that's one thing is how are you going to make your approach? And here's the magic words. I'm just curious. I would like to find out. And so curiosity um, puts judgment on the side. You're not coming here to ask or sound like you're entitled. You're curious to know the, the future. The other thing is in your approach, the conversation needs to deal with attacking the issue, not the person. So it would be helpful if you say, you know, mom and dad, I'd love to start having a conversation about my future uh, and, and get some clarity of your expectations of me on the ranch. So here's three things I'd like to talk about. Not 20 things, just three things and decide what's the most important thing. And for our son, it was knowing that there was a position in place for him on our farm. And when we told him you have till you're 27 to know whether or not you're coming back, and then we did some personal style assessments 
and let him share his vision. That was the game changer for him. But the problem is, Shay, procrastination and conflict avoidance are killing agriculture. So people are not coming to the table because they're afraid. So I'm curious, mom, what are you afraid of? And you know what mom's afraid of? Family fights. But there doesn't have to be family fights if you use an outside third-party facilitator to keep it safe and respectful and do some of the, the pre-work. There doesn't have to be fighting if everybody shows up as an adult, not a four-year-old, right? So every family is going to have some level of comfort or some great degree of discomfort of whether or not they actually want to come to the table by themselves. And I don't recommend do it yourself you know, uh, conversations because sometimes they go badly and then there's nobody who's not emotionally connected to the farm to say, whoa, this is not acceptable behavior. Let's get back on track here. And that's what coaches do and facilitators do. They keep it safe and respectful. So my curiosity for listeners is what is it that you want to know today as you get ready for Thanksgiving, and Shay, I you don't know when this podcast will come out, but this is American Thanksgiving. There's a lot of animosity and anxiety floating around ranches this week because everybody's supposed to come to the table for turkey or ham or whatever, beef, and there's anxiety around, wow, I wonder what's going to happen this year. Well, I would suggest have your turkey on Thursday and on Friday have a, a facilitated or a a well-grounded family meeting. Well, I appreciate that insight. And with this interview being live right now, that works out perfect timing wise. And I guess people catching it on the replay, will make sure you listen beforehand. At least you'll for sure want to. So I'm going to go back to that skill set point. So before a son-in-law or daughter-in-law marries in, how can they make sure that their skill sets are recognized and evaluated so that it's understood where their role can be with the goal of that operation? So what our family uses is called a personal style indicator. It's from crgleader.com with Dr. Ken Key. So it's like a, a personal style assessment that we found out where my, my husband's really wired for task. I'm wired for influence. I'm terrible, Shay, at accounting. I should never do the books and never have and never will. Where is it written that just because I'm female, I should do the books? My daughter-in-law is, is a nurse, trained as a nurse. She could also be an accountant. So she should be the one doing office administration. And my, and my son is called um, uh, Thoughtful Balance. So he's really good for people. So again, there are assessments that you can do to discover how you're wired, but you can also talk about what is it you do, Shay? And I'll ask you this question. What is it that you're doing on the ranch where you lose all track of time? What is that? That's checking pastures in the summer. Yeah. So you love your cat. You love her uh, livestock management, mm -hmm. and that, right? And pasture pasture management. So that that's your sweet spot. That's one of your, that's one of your skill sets. So we have a, we have a tool also in the family meeting where we talk about job descriptions. And again, I have a seven page sheet developed by Dick Whitman that I use. I'm licensed to use his materials called job descriptions, where you can actually write your own job description based on what your skill set is. But here's the point. If you want to manage a ranch, you probably have to gain some new skills, right? So then my other question is, Shay, what do you want to learn that you don't know yet? And one of my learnings, I'm terrible at Excel spreadsheets, but I have other people that can make Excel spreadsheets for me, right? So what is it that you need to learn? And dad needs to learn how to step back and let go. And dad may not be the best teacher of the next gen manager. So who, where's the mentoring going to happen? Who wants to take on that role? Oh, and did we talk to mom? She's given her best 41 years to the ranch and she's pretty tired. She actually wants to do something totally different, but guess who's not coming with her? So thank you for going through that. And we have covered a lot of different topics already in this 30 minute time span. So I just kind of want to recap a little bit of 
what we've talked about for those who are just jumping on. I see a few more hopped on, but we've really talked about setting boundaries, addressing the bull in the room, approaching conversations with curiosity and tackle the problem, not the person. I really like how you said that and a lot of other things, but those are a lot of what are the main points that I pulled out. Are there, is there any other main or big or overarching topic Mm. that we have not addressed yet that you think everyone needs to hear? Well, I suspect, Shay, that many of your listeners are under the age of 35. And when I get young farmers doing my key challenge audit, they check off in the middle of the page. Elaine, one of my challenges is decreasing my anxiety over the uncertainty of my future here. So the question I have for the listeners is, what do you need to stop doing And what do you need to begin? It's like we call it the neutral zone in coaching. So the neutral zone is a place in the pain of not knowing. So tonight, or when you have some time to reflect in your journal or on your Word document or in the notes on your phone, I'd just like you to start aggregating what's bugging you. What are the irritants of things that you don't have clarity of expectation around? You don't know what the timelines look like. And a a big action word for timelines is by when. By when, mom and dad, can we set a date to come to the table to just start exploring the vision for this ranch? By when can I have a signed employee contract? By when will we solidify what our job descriptions are? By when will you just go away and take a few days break so that you know the ranch is not gonna implode if you're not here. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds mm-hmm. of conversations, right? Thousands of conversations, Shay. Well, thank you for that last bit of advice there. And by when, those are the words to remember. So with that, you are going to be speaking at a couple places in the States coming up So can you kind of tell listeners where you'll be at? Uh, If I can say the names right, on December 7th, I'll be in Norfolk, Nebraska. And if people want to register and find out more, we're doing an all-day seminar from about like 10 in the morning-ish to about 3.30. And it's the Nebraska um, grazinglands.org, Nebraska Grazing Alliance. And so you can go just Google Nebraska Grazing lands.org and you'll find it there then they're going to take me three hours away to to southern south dakota to okama okama i'm I'm not sure i'm saying that right anyway i'll be there on the 8th of december and you can find me um at sdgrass.org and then the next day i'll be in rapid city and the interesting thing shay is that the people coming to these workshops will get a workbook a toolbox that Mm -hmm. they can go home Uh, they'll be able to text me privately on my phone which is something I've been doing for years so people um, on Friday I had 25 people texting me I speak I say something that they want more clarification on they say Elaine what about if you have a dad who's not willing to let go or Elaine what do we do with a sister who thinks that she should have half the ranch even though she left when she was 18 so these are our tough questions that that I deal with and it keeps it safe and respectful The other thing I really want people to do is go to farmfamilycoach.com and go to the insights tab and sign up for my, um, my video and blog that comes out every two weeks. And it'll be like having free coaching and I will be dropping in and encouraging you. And you can find me on Instagram and and YouTube as well, but we've just hit the tip of the iceberg tonight, Shay. And I have a sign behind me that I put here for all of us listening on live tonight is to be thankful And here's the deal. Lack of appreciation is putting ranches sideways. So when you get a chance to say thank you this weekend or on Thursday, be really thankful for the opportunity you've been given. And that will go a long way to having more powerful conversations. Well, Elaine, thank you once again for being on the show tonight and doing this live interview for all those Facebook listeners out there. This will be up on the replay and I will put links to what Elaine just talked about in the comments for anyone listening. So with that, have a good night, Elaine. Yeah, you too, Shay, and happy Thanksgiving. Pleasure to be with you all tonight. Bye.